Math 43, welcome to the Chapter 2 Keynote Summary. So in Chapter 2, we took a look at a bunch of graphs for numerical data, and we, we came up with some vocab to help us describe those graphs, describe those distributions. So the first piece of information I always want you to comment on is the shape. And I want you to tell me about outliers, center, and spread. Keeping in mind that there's a bunch of options for all four of those um, pieces of your graph, right? There's a bunch of options for shape. Outliers, it's really a yes or a no. There's a bunch of measures of center and a bunch of measures of spread. And I don't need all of them for every graph, but I need at least one. And if you have clusters or gaps present, let me know that they're present and tell me where they are. All right, and you, you've heard me rem uh, talk about that acronym, remember your socks. So as we move through this keynote, first we're gonna look at the types of graphs that we talked about in chapter two, and then we're really gonna break down this, this socks thing. So our shape, outliers, center, and spread. All right, so the first type of graph, or one of the graphs that we talked about in chapter two was a stem and leaf plot. And you can see I've got my stems here, I've got my leaves over here, yeah, stems here, leaves over here. And in both of these graphs, you can see that I have a key, right? I'm telling you right here, that a five in the stems place and a nine in the leaves place means I have scored 59 out of 60, whatever that means. So if I look at this number here, three dash five, I know that's 35, right? Because if I didn't have that key, I wouldn't know if three dash five, maybe it meant 3.5, right? Or maybe it meant 3,500, or maybe it meant 35,000, but this key right here tells me, no, it, it just means 35. All right, now on this side of things, they don't have a key directly, but it's, it's actually hidden up here. We can see that 55 is in inches and three is in 0.1 inches. So what that would mean is if I had 55 of a leaf and a stem of three, or excuse me, 55 with a stem and a leaf of three, that meant 55.3 inches. All right, so as long as I have a key, that's great. Now this one at least has a title. Right? It's saying I'm showing you the graph or the distribution of heights. All right? And I don't know what this, this is in reference to. It looks like some t type of test, but there was no title mis um, on this one, unfortunately. So make sure when you draw me a stem and leaf graph that you're giving me a title and a key. And now let me erase all the markings I have. And as I'm doing that, I want you to think about the shape of these stem and leaf plots. All right, so think about the shape. And I'm going to start with the right stem and leaf plot first. So the, the larger stem and leaf, we're going to talk about its shape. So if I, I can't do it on this keynote, but if I kind of move my head to the side and draw a little bit of a curve there, that thing actually, if I'm taking a look at it, I would say that thing looks roughly symmetric. It's not too bad taking a look at it. All right. And maybe I would say it also looks a little bit skewed left. And I know we haven't explicitly talked about shape in this keynote, but we have talked about it in the chapter. So just taking a look, it looks like the left tail is a little bit longer than the right tail. And I want you to notice that the variables on this artificial x-axis here on the stems, they're going from low to high. And that's a good thing. That's what I would want to have happen if I was making, if I rotated this, this graph 90 degrees and, and drew it on an x-axis. Now here, if we head over to the one on the left, this stem and leaf plot here, if you look at it, it kind of looks like it's skewed left because you'd say, well, the right tail looks long. I'm sorry, I think I said that wrong. Kind of looks skewed right because the right tail is longer than the left tail. But the thing that you have to notice is, and let me change colors here, is that the stems are going in the wrong order. You see that they're going from high to low here so really, instead of saying this graph is skewed to the right, I would say it was skewed left. We always have to flip what we're thinking, okay? So, so that's what we got, at least for stem and leaf plots. Let's go ahead and take a look at a back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot. And this was just me doing a bunch of Google images. All right, so things that I would say if I was looking at, at these, um, these Google image back-to-back -back stem and leaf plots, right? This one's missing a title and a key. Right? They didn't have those, right? Same, well, at least here they have, I know it's heart rates, but I don't know what the, the key is, right? So I don't know what the key is. All right, so here, same deal. It looks like I've got some before and after. Oh, I'm over on this one, sorry. Before and after for exercises. At least I see the title, right? But I don't see a key. 
All right, here I see a key, which is great. I think this is have to do with some kind of exam. I wish maybe I had a little bit more information. Um, on this one on the upper right, I don't see either. And the reason I saved this one till the end is because this graph, and again, it was just from Google Images, but this is inherently incorrect. All right, and so try and pause if you want. Think about why am I pointing out this one? I mean, I, again, I got it from Google Images and I, I glommed onto it because I was like, oh, that's a bad stem and leaf plot. And there's something distinctly different in this graph than there is in either of these other four or any of these other four. All right, and so if you're still with me, the problem is the stems. So if you see here, this jump from zero to three, it skipped over one and two, and you can't do that. It also skipped over five and six, can't do that either. So when you skip over those stems, you can't see the gaps, and that's a problem. Because you need to be able to see those gaps. That, that graph needs to represent your data. Okay, so we also talked about histograms, right? Histograms, they look just like bar charts, right? They're a bunch of rectangles. They're similar, um, excuse me, they use numerical data instead of categorical data, that's it, but your variable is on your x-axis, frequency or relative frequencies along your y, and you got some rectangles. We typically don't have spaces between the bars, which is a little bit different from bar charts, all right? The spaces only exist if there's a gap in the data. So here's some, some bar charts, excuse me, here's some histograms, but here we go. I want to give you some other shapes, right? Here's a bimodal graph, right? Now this says negatively skewed, but I would call that skewed left. It says positively skewed, say skewed right. And this one, this is unitary, which is fine. When we get to chapter five, we're gonna actually talk about a uniform distribution. All right, and what that means is the height is pretty much the same. And that's where the word uniform comes from, right? So rectangles have the same height. And when that happens, we say it's a uniform distribution. So let me write have same height. And that's a uniform distribution. Now, if I asked you guys before I put this up here, what is the shape of that histogram, right? Taking a look that we have a numerical variable on our x-axis, ages, right? And these are ages of these faculty members at a university. And we have relative frequency along the y-axis, all right? So the shape of that, you can see if I put a little curve over that, that would be skewed left. And then let me get this out of the way. If I asked you what was the shape of this blue histogram, where I've got a numerical variable on the x-axis, and then I've got some kind of proportion or relative frequency along the y. All right, if I asked you what was the shape here, I'm hoping that you would tell me, and I'll, I'll kind of run out of space, that this was skewed right. And you can even see in here the cumulative graph. All right, you can see it being sketched out there because that cumulative graph always grows from left to right. And that's why they have the phrase cumulative distribution over here. Okay, so moving along from there, here are some important buttons off of your calculator, right? We'll use the y equals a bunch, especially when we do stat plots, second and y equals, right? Use the zoom button, zoom nine. Um, you'll use graph if you ever have to adjust the zoom nine window and you don't wanna reset it to zoom nine. Stat, it's a real big button. Make sure you, 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 know, you're, you know where that is. If all else fails, just pick that button. It's probably what you needed to pick. We'll be using bars a lot, the comma key. You'll get used to those, but you do want to become more and more familiar with those calculator buttons. Okay, so if I wanted to make a stat plot, right, I'll hit second and y equals, and I'll get my stat plots up. And you can see when I took this screenshot for right now, I have one plot on and two plots off. And you can toggle them on and off as much as you like. All right, now if I head into my plot and I choose this icon, that would be the histogram. And this, this you can't quite see it, but the word on would have been under there. Um, we will learn the other five of these. So we will learn in chapter 12, we'll pick up the scatter plots. Um, actually, in this chapter, you did pick up the box plot and the modified box plot. And then eventually we will just mention the normal probability plot. So once you turn those plots on and you select your histogram, You'll either have your, well, you'll always have your variable in L1. And if you have frequency data, that'll typically be in L2. Or if you've put every value of your data set into L1 exactly once, you'll leave that um, frequency as one. So you'll either have a one or an L2, just depending on how your data was given to you. And then you go ahead and you hit zoom nine. 
and you get a histogram. Now we're gonna play a little game, all right, to try and get ahead of me. If, if you looked at this graph, all right, would it be a histogram or a bar chart? So pause the video, right, get an idea. Okay, you ready? Big reveal. Oh, 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 it's a bar chart. So exciting. And that's because if you look at the x-axis, it's a categorical variable. Right? And you can see the spaces are between the bars. Okay, great. And we still got some frequencies along the y-axis, which is great. Okay, here comes the next one. All right, so histogram or bar chart. Hmm. Pause the video, get an answer. Ready for the big reveal? Mm -mm -mm. Oh my God, it's the histogram. And that's because you can see we have a numerical variable along the x-axis, right? We've got frequency along the y, and that's great. I mean, you got no spaces between the bars. There was no gaps in the data. Okay, fantastic. All right, so let's just look at a couple more um, statistics, and then we'll, we'll put a pause on this video, and then we'll pick it up again in the second half of the, um, we'll do, I'm breaking the summary keynotes into two parts this time. Okay, so one of the statistics we got, the big one, mean, right? And it's really saying add up all of the values in your data set and divide by your sample size. And while this thing, that might look scary, if you remember, that is capital sigma in the Greek alphabet. So we have lowercase sigma, whoops, excuse me, let me go ahead and play that again. Oops, so let me try this one more time. So we have sigma in the Greek alphabet, we have lowercase sigma and we have uppercase sigma. It's equivalent to our alphabet where we have lowercase s and capital S. But when you see this capital sigma here, all it's saying is just to add some stuff. So add up all the values of your variable, divide by sample size. All right, we've got the median, which is the middle number. If you have an odd number of data values, you have exactly one middle number. If you have an even number of data values, you have two middle numbers and you take their average. But one of our stats will get that for you. And we've got the mode, all right? And these are three measures of center. Eventually, when you do the chapter two deep dive, you'll pick up the mid-range, all right? And these actually make up your four main measures of center. They call them, if you, you ever hear a book refer to the four Ms, that's what they're talking about. And if you wanna look up mid-range, great. And if you wanna wait till we get it on the deep dive, great. All right, so measures of center. There's variance that we picked up, there's the standard deviation, there's the range, the spread, and the IQR. And these are all measures of spread or variability. Now, I, I typically use spread because that's the S in socks, but I personally like the phrase variability a little bit more. Now, our alphabet, S squared, that is the sample variance, right? S, sample standard deviation. These are parameters. This is the population variance. This is the population standard deviation. So the only way to find these two is to run a census. Okay, and keep in mind, we want to make sure you understand the relationship between, oops, that happens when I do that, excuse me. Let me do this one more time. Okay, we want to, I want to make sure you understand the relationship between variance and standard deviation, right? So if you have a variance and you want to get to standard deviation, take its square root. If you have a standard deviation and you want to get up to variance, you need to square that number. All right, now the range is just high minus low. Spread is actually quoting both numbers, the low and the high, and IQR is Q3 minus Q1, okay? Now, when it comes to giving me your socks, I only need one of these numbers, right? I don't need all five, so pick one. All right, now in terms of measures of position, we've got the lower quartile, the upper quartile, the second quartile, or the median, and Z-scores. Right, and this just tells me where are you located. It doesn't fit into that acronym, that's the SOX, but it tells me where you are located, right? You're in the lower 25% of, of your data set, the lower 75%, you're right there in the middle. We, we're gonna talk about Z-scores on the next slide. And I also wanna mention the IQR, we tend to forget this. The IQR is the middle 50% of your data. Right? If you think of your data set and you've got your min and max here and you break it up into fourths right? and you've got Q1 and Q3 over here, right? this is the middle 50% because this is 25%, this is 25%, this is 25%, and this is 25%. So IQR is always the middle 50%. Okay, and then Z-scores. 
we picked up the formula in this chapter, but I want to give you a heads up. These are going to come back around in a big way in chapter six. All right. And we're going to talk about, we'll, we'll mention it, or excuse me, you'll work on it a little bit in your homework that Z-scores give you a common scale to compare data. You're going to do an example where you compare GPAs of students from different schools. And you're going to see that these students go to schools with very different D GPA systems. So how do we compare who's performing better, relatively speaking? Well, we get Z-scores and compare Z-scores, right? They give a common scale to compare data from different data sets. All right, they tell you how many standard deviations above or below the mean any one data value is. So if you were talking about GPA and you told me your Z-score was two, that would tell me you were two standard deviations above the mean, which is really hard to do. It's actually hard to be that far above the mean. Right? If your Z-score was negative two, I would know that you were two standard deviations below the mean. All right, positive z-scores are above the mean, negative z-scores are below the mean. All right, and like I said, this is going to come back around in chapter six. All right, so with that, we're going to pause for right now, and then I'm going to start up the second um, video for this summary keynote, and I will see you in a little bit. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Oops, <laughs> bye. <laughs>